I think without a shadow of a doubt, we can say that the truly wealthy of the world think differently than most of the rest of us. Here's a case in point. In 2010, an estate put up for auction at Sotheby's an antique Chippendale commode. The excitement around this piece was impressive, and the piece was bid up to an amazing price in pound sterling that was the equivalent of $5.9 million. Now while the rest of us would agree that this piece of furniture is attractive, even if we could do so, how many would even dream of paying such a high price for it? Therein lies one of the major barriers in thought that will separate the winners from the losers when the credit market is reset. And so, we should explore this in more depth. Most would think that the true value of an item is derived by its utility. Take, for example, this solid wood chest of drawers shown on the right. It retails for $2,000 and is arguably much more functional than the unit on the left. It is larger, it has more drawers, and it is brand new and thus could be expected to last longer when put to regular use. So why is the furniture on the left worth $5.9 million, while the piece on the right is only worth $2,000? The difference in price is related to utility, but it is a different kind of utility. The Chippendale furniture is worth so much more not because of its utility as furniture, but because of its utility as a proven store of value. The buyer of this item wouldn't dream of putting it to use. So, has the Chippendale furniture held its value? Absolutely. In fact, those who have owned it over time have seen their real wealth increase. In contrast, those who buy the typical furniture shown on the right will be able to use it for a long time, but when they go to resell it, they will find that their wealth has gradually decreased over time. In other words, the furniture on the right depreciates while the furniture on the left appreciates in real terms. But the real question that we need to ask is, what attracts the attention of the uber-wealthy to items such as the Chippendale furniture? How do we know if the item they buy will appreciate or depreciate in value? While it might seem like an academic exercise for you and me, because who, after all, could afford to make such a purchase, the decision-making process actually does have some profound implications for the rest of us. So let's consider another expensive item that most of us would consider to be insanely priced. To the left is a picture of a label from one of three bottles of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild 1869 vintage wine that was auctioned off by Sotheby's in 2010. The three bottles were bid up to $700,000, which works out to be $233,000 per bottle. Obviously, the person who won this auction was not buying it for its utility in use. If he wanted a fine bottle of French wine to drink, he could have easily purchased this bottle of Chateau Belair Monage shown on the right for $170. Certainly, he could opt to buy a less expensive bottle of wine. But let's assume that the uber-wealthy individual has expensive taste. The bottle on the right, in addition to being less expensive, is probably much more drinkable. After all, the Chateau Lafitte, by this point in time, might simply be $233,000 uh, worth of vinegar, for all the buyer knows. The only way to find out for sure is to open the bottle up and take a sip. Of course, by then, the buyer is committed to his $233,000 gamble. So why would a person pay such a high price for wine that is likely to never be opened? It must be for reasons other than utility of the wine as a beverage. It is for the wine's proven ability to preserve and grow wealth over time. And to drive the point home, let's do a rate of return calculation. Assume that the Chateau Lafitte cost in 1869 was $170 per bottle in current dollar terms. It may have been less, it may have been more, but this is a reasonable approximation. Over the 140 years that have passed since the wine was fermented, its real value has increased 1,370 times. This is a compound rate of return of 5.1%, tax deferred, after inflation. Not bad for an item that just sits on the shelves and will never be opened. So again, we must ask the question, why did the buyer pay so much? How does he know that the wine will continue to increase in value? Again, while you and I would have some difficulty shelling out this amount of money for this store of value, the decision-making process can be of some use to us. So, while we're considering the insane prices of the items recently auctioned, let's play a game, shall we? Suppose I put you in a soundproof room and place on a table in front of you 
a piece of paper with four identical squares drawn on it. I tell you that there is another person in another room who has a similar piece of paper in front of him. The game will cost you $50 each to play, if you choose to do so. So the total cost to play is $100. If you play, you will each be given a chance to select one square. Each of your choices will not be made known to each other until after both of you have chosen. If, at the end of the game, you have both chosen the same square, then you will each be given $100. If you choose different squares, then you will not get anything. You have one and only one opportunity to play this game. Given these rules, would you play this game? Think about it for a few seconds. The answer is that the rational person would choose not to play this game. There is only a 25% chance that you and your isolated partner in the other room will select the same square and double your money. There is a 75% chance that you'll lose all of your money. So this is a game where you actually are worse off for having played. But what if we change the rules slightly? What if I tell you that one of the squares will be colored red, the same one will be colored red in the other room, and you can play the game as often as you like? Will this change your willingness to play? It should. We've given you and we've given your isolated partner a reason to choose the upper left square. While we haven't made any of the squares a necessarily better square than any other, we've given one of them a distinguishing characteristic. Making one square different makes it more likely that your isolated partner will pick that square. At the same time, your isolated partner now knows that your likelihood of picking the red square is higher than that of the others. So you decide to play. You both pick the red square. You both double your money and you both decide that it is in your best interest to keep playing the game unless the rules are changed. So what we have done is introduce what in game theory is called salience to one of our squares. We've made one square more notable than the rest. Salience is a concept which was introduced in 1960 by Nobel Prize winner Thomas Schelling in his book The Strategy of Conflict. A salient point was also called a focal point. The way Schelling described a focal point was, quote, each person's expectation of what the other expects him to expect to be expected to do, end quote. <laughs> yes, that's a mouthful. Yes, it seems confusing. But it has been seen to work for various experiments. For example, suppose you are to meet someone in New York City on a certain date at a certain time. You do not know ahead of time where that person will be and you have no way to communicate. The other person also does not know where you will choose to be. An impossible situation? Probably not. Schelling asked a group of New York students where they would choose to go, and the most common answer was Grand Central Station. Thus, Grand Central Station was the solution to this game that had the highest probability of a payoff, simply because it was the most salient point. So what does this have to do with our question of why the uber-wealthy will select certain items to purchase and will pay prices that seem, to the rest of us, to be unjustified based upon how useful these items are? Plenty. And why should we pay attention to what they buy? Well, it's because most of the super-wealthy have acquired their wealth over generations. Most of the items that have been handed down or auctioned off to others in the elite community have survived and even done very well in credit market failures. These items share characteristics that provide them with salience. Firstly, and most importantly, these items are stores of value. They have a record of transactions at high prices that reinforce the notion that they will continue to command a premium value. Others have already voted for them, and not just verbally, they voted with their wallets. And the high price has to do with the fact that these items fulfill their purpose of preserving value. These items tend to be very tightly held. The super wealthy generally hold on to these items as just-in-case wealth, wealth that can be liquidated in case everything else goes wrong. And so they tend not to have to sell them. How frequently do you see Van Gogh paintings up for auction? Not very frequently. That's because they tend to be held for long periods of time and not sold. They offer unambiguous ownership. 
Unlike a publicly traded company whose assets might be liquidated to satisfy the bondholders during a credit crisis, these items, once owned and stored, are the unquestioned property of the owner. There is no worry over rehypothecation or any other such nonsense. They offer unlimited upside. If the only real use of an item is as a store of value, then it really doesn't matter how high the price goes. There will be willing buyers so long as they have reason to believe that others will do the same. There's that salience principle again. And a high price doesn't adversely affect society at all. Does it really matter to you if someone owns a $6 million piece of furniture? The other aspect is something that we've discussed before, and that is status. One thing that continues to drive those who have more wealth than they could ever spend in a lifetime is status. Obtaining items that are difficult to obtain is something that can be used to set a person aside and make him or her feel more important. And finally, we have liquidity. The owner of one of these items knows that because of its special rarity, there will be many excited buyers waiting to outbid each other when the item is put to the auction. All of these characteristics make certain items very favorable for preserving and possibly growing wealth, even during a credit crisis. Sure, the stocks and bonds in private enterprise owned by each family may fail, but these are the items that will make sure that the family fortune endures. It is for this reason we should study them, especially if we have reason to doubt the soundness of the credit system. After all, in a credit market collapse, the rich and powerful of the world will probably value these enduring items even more highly than they do now. Now let's list a few items that the elite of the world buy for preserving wealth. Just the things that will survive an extreme credit crisis. Of these, we have land and buildings, fine jewelry, rare art, vintage wines, antique furniture, collector cars, very rare numismatic coins, very rare stamps, and gold. There are more items not listed here, but they can't all be listed. All of these items listed will maintain their value if the world financial system implodes. Some of these items may even go up in value considerably. After all, if the health of the financial system is in question, then the super wealthy will be the first to be aware of it. Don't you think that their eagerness to obtain these items, which are proven stores of value, will increase? I think we're already starting to see this, in process, this process in motion with the recent record auction announcements. Of course, many of these items are the sole domain of the very rich. After all, how many of us could really afford to buy a $16 million Ferrari 250 Testarossa, such as the one that was auctioned in 2011? There really are only a few that we can take advantage of. We can eliminate a few right off the bat that average people could never afford. Sure, we can buy jewelry but not the kind that serve as salient points to the super-rich. There is no way to obtain and afford the kind of peace that people would fervently bid on if it were to hit the market. The same can be said for the type, uh, for the type of art, wines, furniture, and cars that the super-rich collect. Sure, we can, to a certain extent, buy lower-quality items that we would consider to be highly priced, but not the kind of things that a person could guarantee would continue to increase in value. The rich buy items at auction that have a long history of fetching high prices. The type of art, or wine, or collector car that most of us can afford to buy just doesn't have that type of history. Of course, there are other drawbacks that we should consider. Land and buildings aren't really meant to be hoarded. Sure, they can be, but who wants to be vilified for holding a resource that others need to use and benefiting from the increased valuation. That's the kind of thing that draws the profiteer label. It's the kind of thing that makes a person a target. As far as stamps and numismatic coins are concerned, these items are very much possibilities for preserving wealth in the event of a credit collapse. The only drawback is that the coins and stamps that the common person can afford are not the same ones that are sought after by the elite of the world. And so, the upside potential will be quite limited because the elite will not be interested in buying the lower-priced items. It's just too much trouble for them to 
to want the lower value items. It takes too many of them to be of any significance. But that draws our attention to the remaining item, gold. Gold is something that we know the elite of the world buy for wealth protection in turbulent times. We also know that because gold is fungible, one piece of it is as good as any other. This gives us the opportunity to take advantage on a small scale of one of the primary wealth protection tools of the elite. While we can't afford to buy the collector items that the elite buy, we can buy gold, and unlike rare wines, we know it will be the same quality as what they own. Most importantly, we know that gold is a point of salience for the wealthy. It will always be desired because it always has been desired. In the event of a credit market collapse, it will have the potential to be valued much higher than it is now relative to the cost of common goods and services. And this unlimited upside is because instead of being valued for its utility and use, it is valued for its utility as a store of value. It is very tightly held now and is likely to be even more tightly held going forward. It offers the benefit of privacy and unambiguous ownership. It will be highly liquid for those who wish to sell it. Most importantly, it will have the bid of the elite behind it, and they will likely value it very, very highly. Take advantage of this opportunity that you have now to obtain a small piece of what the super wealthy have used throughout time to preserve and build wealth. Once the run on gold progresses in earnest and the supply of gold dries up, gold may only be available at a valuation that is multiples higher than it is valued now.